All right. Good afternoon, Facebook, and welcome to another episode of You've Got the Power. I'm your host, Dr. Jason Deitch, here with my great friend, Dr. Chris Centeno, founder and medical director of the Centeno Schultz Clinic in Colorado, as well as the Regenex Network of Orthopedic Regenerative orthopedists around the world that are ready to help you. Today's topic is all about low back, low back pain, stem cells, the truth about stem cells, fact and fiction. If you're watching, now is the time to ask your question. If you're experiencing low back pain or any pain for that matter, and you want to find out if there is a more natural approach to help you reduce your risk of needing drugs and surgery, then the way to find out is to speak to one of the Regenex doctors or specifically somebody at the Centeno Schultz Clinic. Dr. Centeno, good afternoon. Great to see you today. Good afternoon, Jason. Let's, uh, let's get right into it. Uh, there's a lot of facts. There's even more fiction as it relates to the conversation between low back pain, stem cells, uh, what people understand stem cells to be and not be. So let me just sort of kick it over to you and, and just sort of help us paint the landscape of how we should be accurately looking at this issue and this topic. Yeah, Jason, I mean, one of the really fascinating things about stem cells and, and low back is that there's just an immense amount of misinformation out there. Uh, you know, one of the, the more interesting things is when I see the average low back patient walking in, I saw two this morning, a couple yesterday. Uh, generally, what happens with that patient is that there's a certain small set of things that stem cells work well for, and there's a larger subset of things that platelets work well for. So we'll generally move a lot of those patients towards platelets. Now, sometimes they don't want to hear that. Sometimes they want the stem cells. But, you know, we have that discussion of, hey, I think there's an 80% chance Platelets will work here, so why not give that a shot? That's much less expensive than us going to stem cells. Also, it's less invasive. It's a blood draw versus a bone marrow draw. Then we get in. So there's that whole issue of trying to find the technology that actually fits their problem the best. And then you get into the second issue of, you know, there's a dramatic difference between the expertise that that we operate at and the expertise that many of these patients are getting so for for example you know we're using sophisticated x-ray ultrasound guidance to place these cells and replace from the disc to the facet joint and the ligaments that hold the head on and and yet they're going to some clinics and all they're really getting is a muscle trigger point injection that's done blind meaning uh you know a, a tiny amount of expertise to put it someplace versus a large amount. Um, and many times, you know, patients don't know the difference. They don't know that their disc didn't get injected. They don't know that the cells didn't go where they were supposed to. They just know that someone did some sort of injection in their low back. And then you got the third big issue, which is many times they're not even getting stem cells at all. They're just getting a uh, amniotic fluid or a umbilical cord blood product that has no living stem cells. So those are the big issues that we see in fact versus fiction in, in this area. And, and that's really the question is, is how do people know? You know, I know, you know, my background as a chiropractor, you say the word chiropractor or chiropractic, and there's a whole spectrum of what people think that means. Uh, some people go to chiropractors, and never get an adjustment. Uh, other people go to chiropractors and have all kinds of different things happen to them I know a similar, um, I'll say sort of misunderstanding or uh, you know, lack of awareness relates to the, using the word s stem cells. Um, how do people understand the difference between you know, what we would call autologous from your own body's stem cells versus you know, these other products that uh, in many kids don't even have living stem cells in them? How does a consumer understand how to really navigate fact versus fiction, which stem cells are the stem cells and which stem cells are really not. Uh, you've got charismatic people presenting them. They all love to hold up the badge of science. Um, most common people get intimidated. Science, okay, they must know I don't. How do you 
ask the right questions or think about it so that you go, here's how I know the difference between fact versus fiction. Yeah, a really, really simple one in this area is right now sitting here in 2020 and probably for 2021 as well. There is no such thing as a stem cell product that can be sold in the U.S. Uh, that comes from somebody else. So if you're at a, uh, a seminar that someone put on and they're talking about these plentiful stem cells that come from umbilical cords or amniotic tissue, uh, which are basically birth tissues, you know off the bat you're being lied to. Uh, there's multiple studies now done by our lab, uh, CSU, Colorado State University, uh, Orthopedic Research Center here by Cornell, by UC uh, Davis, that all show the same thing. Those products have no living stem cells. So it's a really easy thing. If someone tells you that the stem cells are coming from somebody else, and that's usually from birth tissues, you automatically know that that's fiction uh, because four different uh, places with, with high-level labs have tested all of that. Um, and if they tell you they're getting stem cells from you, that's much more likely to be true. Uh, you can't get stem cells from blood, but you can get them from bone marrow. You can get them from fat. So uh, that's pretty much it. It's a very simple thing. If, if you're hearing the cells are coming from someone else, in 2020 or 2021, you just shake your head and walk out of the room. So that is a great benchmark. It is a great way to understand that, you know, the principle here, uh, and we feel this way as chiropractors, it's great. And this is why we get along as well as we do that really the body has, your body has the greatest potential to heal your body uh, than anything else out there. It, it sounds overly simplistic, but most of us aren't doing much thinking. We're just doing a lot of believing. Um, and unfortunately, believing in people that may not have our best interest or maybe fooled themselves. Again, science is this really interesting thing. Uh, there's lots of, you know, surgeons and medical doctors that are told and sold that, you know, there's science behind opioids, for an example, or many of these medical devices. We recently covered, you know, sacroiliac joint uh, um, there's just so much misinformation when you throw up the word science, people tend to stop thinking and just sort of accept that to be the truth. So look for making sure that it's coming from your own body. It's the, it's the smartest place to start. Let's go over to Hillary's question. And if you've got questions and you're watching, you want to know about low back pain, stem cells. If you've got questions about your own body, your own situation, or uh, in general, how to know truth versus, I'll say fake news or fact versus fiction, as they call it these days. Uh, let's take a look at what Hillary has to say. Uh, Ola, can you comment on the difference if there is one between a stretch ligament and a micro torn ligament? Which injury can regenerative medicine help and which approach would you use for each type? Great question. Yeah, Hillary, they're really kind of the same thing. Um, when you have a stretched ligament, by definition, there has to be micro tears in it for the ligament to have gotten stretched out. Um, uh, so that's kind of, you know, one category, micro tear, stretch ligament, and then you get into a partial tear um, where there's still some fibers left. And then you get into a complete tear where there's tearing through and through the ligament but there's still some fire fibers left and that's called complete non-retracted. Then you get into complete retracted, which is where if, like if you snipped a rubber band and they go back. So uh, regenerative medicine through injection can help with the first three, um, which is that micro tear stretch, the partial tear and the complete non-retracted, but not that fourth one, which is the complete retracted where it's like snipping a rubber band and the two halves come back. Doc, what, what do you say to people who are, uh, in many cases, trying to self-diagnose? Um, you know, many of these questions, I, I see people trying to think through for themselves, and I encourage thinking through for yourself 100%. Um, but I guess I'm asking, what is your thought on people trying to figure out their best treatment for themselves versus finding the right center, finding the right doctor, finding a sort of partner who can help them think through from the doctor's perspective, 
what's best for them. I, I see a lot of questions and it feels as if people are trying to you know, walk in saying, here's what I want. Uh, is that the approach that you recommend or should they really be asking questions about the integrity of the doctor, integrity of the facility, uh, and in ways sort of leave it to the doctor to say stem cells, PRP, something else. What are your thoughts on how people should be processing that information and coming to those decisions? Yeah, listen, I mean, we have, you know, certainly an educated patient is a, is a good patient uh, to have. And, you know, we get helped by educated patients that kind of know what's going on with them or can, you know, give us some information to push us this direction or that direction. So I would definitely encourage that. I would encourage patients to try to understand what it is they have and establish sort of a collaborative partnership with the doctor going back and forth to figure out what's best with them. So at the same time, obviously, you don't want to get in a situation where you are so hell-bent on having treatment A um, that you won't consider treatment B that the doctor has decided is probably best for you. So I think it's it's a collaborative relationship, um, and a, that's a critical part because those people tend to get better quicker. You know, as, a, as an example, you know, the other day, uh, actually it was yesterday, I was talking to a patient who had made the comment that I should, you know, let's take a look at the area of the spinal cord right uh, behind C2. And it was, a, it was a good call. I mean, I think he understood that that was a problem area for him. It directed my attention there. I could also then talk to him about some other things that I saw. But that was a, that was a net positive for me. That was helpful. It was a time saver. Yeah, and, and I've had that same experience. People walk in and they go, do you do X, Y, Z technique? You know, fill in the blank. Um, because a friend somewhere, somewhere down the line mentioned, oh, I felt better. And they use, you know, the Palmer technique, for example, or some name that they throw out. They know nothing about the technique. Uh, they wouldn't know it if they saw it. Um, but in, many, you know, in, a, in a handful of cases, they come to the practice and basically evaluate my skills to be able to help them based on something they read or heard somewhere down the line. Um, and, it, and it just, I think, prevents and interferes with exactly what you're describing is, you know, really finding out who you're working with, um, getting, you know, feedback, not about necessarily the exact technical skill that they have as much as, uh, and then not even the outcomes, because people in many cases do respond differently based on how long they have waited but really the trust in being able to provide you the right advice that is based on your needs, not necessarily their financial motivation or their employment restrictions, which is extremely common these days when you're working with larger systems that have to systematize these types of procedures and so on. Let's go back to questions and comments. We've got Hillary saying, um, I think it's hard for some patients to completely leave it to the doctor because the ver uh, very experiences that might lead us to a place like Regenex are the same ones that might lead us to not blindly trust a doctor. It's exactly true in the point we're bringing up. Um, do you want to elaborate in any more detail or it's really, you know, find the right doctor you trust and really be a partner. Um, but I, what I heard you say was don't be so hell bent on this is the way I know it needs to be done uh, without being open to what your hopefully trusted, credible doctor is suggesting. Sound right to you? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think, again, you know, especially in diagnoses that are hard to diagnose, that, uh, that basically, you know, you go see any five doctors and they look at you like you have an eye in the middle of your forehead. Um, you know, those patients do need to be much more staunch advocates for themselves. And I think it's critical that they are. Um, uh, again, just having said that, you also need to find that trusted uh, person who you can be a partner in partnership with to try to guide the right treatment. And then the doctor also sometimes needs to respect where the patient is. I've seen patients where, you know, I would have done A, B, and C, but just talking to the patient, you get a sense that all we're going to get done right now is A, and that's fine. If we want to just do A, let's do A, see how you do. And then maybe we can later add B and C, and that's just part of meeting the patient where they are. And that's a critical thing to do as a doctor is to meet them where they are 
wherever that is. And sometimes I've also been in situations where a patient really said, I need this, I need to do this thing. I might not have started there, but I'll say, yeah, great. We'll do that thing. We'll see if it works. And I think there's a little downside. If it doesn't work, we can do what, what I'm talking about right now. So again, I think you need to meet patients where they are. And for those patients that have really difficult things to diagnose, they tend to really, really obviously have very set ideas on what it is they have. Um, and a lot of times they're right, but sometimes they're wrong. And when they are, hopefully we can have that conversation. Yeah, Hillary, uh, your, your thinking is right on. It is true. Uh, nobody is suggesting blind faith. Uh, you're exactly right. Uh, blind faith is what gets most people in trouble. Um, but there is something to asking, you know, questions that align with your philosophy. For example, now you know uh, to ask questions like, uh, are these stem cells coming from my body or from somewhere else? Uh, a great way to at least start understanding and deciphering fact versus fiction, today's topic, of course. So, Hillary, thank you for your question, of course. Thank you for watching. Ryan has a question for us. Uh, he says, good day. Uh, can pain generated by a torn disc be treated with PRP or stem cell treatment? And if so, how effectively? Yeah, uh, Ryan, so when it comes to pain from torn discs, that's one of those areas where stem cells tend to work pretty well. Um, so that's also called discogenic pain or pain coming from the disc. Um, now, you know, there are studies out there that show that PRP can help with that too. Uh, so it wouldn't be unreasonable to try PRP. Uh, in our hands, and our experience, bone marrow stem cells tend to work better, um, but there's also some research on PRP there. So yes, uh, that, that's a good uh, thing uh, and fit for orthobiologic injections. And that's good because many of those patients otherwise uh, who are still having pain despite physical therapy, medications, et cetera, would end up getting a fusion. Um, so that's a that's a very good fit for orthobiologic orthobiologic injections. Now you then have to realize that you actually have to put that stuff inside the disc. There's only one way that happens, and that's with X-ray guidance or fluoroscopy. So you have to have a doctor that uses fluoroscopy. If you go to into a, a doctor's office and they're using ultrasound, they're not getting into the disc. If you go to a doctor's office not using any guidance, they're not getting into the disc. Uh, that's a very uh, difficult, technically demanding procedure to perform, especially for the first hundred of them that you do. Um, so you just can't get that through any clinic. You'd have to go to a very specialized clinic that has the ability to use x-ray guidance and a doctor who's done it a bunch of times and obviously has a sense of what to do. And, and as far as the difference, he's asking, you know, PRP or stem cell treatment, uh, just for, you know, general knowledge, is it based on how extensive the damage is to determine PRP or stem cells? Is it based on somebody's, you know, personal, you know, body in some particular way? Some people work better with PRP versus stem cells. What's the thought process behind which one you would choose? Yeah, many times in many of the things we do, it is based on that extent of damage, PRP, uh, less damage, uh, stem cells, more damage. In this particular case, though, oftentimes, really both of them will work. So oftentimes, it's really discussing with the patient uh, where they're at financially. PRP is cheaper than stem cells. And where they're at in the spectrum of care, meaning are they at their wit's end and they need for this to, to work on the first try, or they are maybe willing to try something less expensive first and if only if that fails, try something more expensive. Um, so a lot of times for this, it's a little bit more working with the patient, but many other applications, it, it is based on severity. And, and just for clarity and not to play word games or something, but you know, you mentioned when it fails. Is, is that uh, it, it fails as in doesn't really get any result or doesn't get them as far as they'd like to go? How, how do you define, quote, fails? Yeah, when I say fails, uh, it doesn't get them any results. So uh, for, uh, for someone with discogenic pain, uh, the good news is there would be a high success rate about 80% of the time. Uh, we should be able to get rid of it or dramatically help it. Uh, but that still leaves two out of 10 patients that don't respond. Uh, and sometimes it's 
they didn't respond as much as they like. I had a gentleman this morning who had degenerative disc disease in his low back. We had done a platelet procedure. Um, he definitely was improved, but hadn't gotten where he wanted to go yet. So not really a failure as much as it was he would like to be further down the road. Um, and for him, that means uh, retreatment. And again, to define the word so people do understand, uh, you know, a surgical failure has a different consequence than the description you're giving. Uh, are there sort of reactions or negative things people need to be concerned about? Or, you know, you're just putting the body's fluids, biologics into the same body. Uh, not really any negative consequences or, you know, surgery that fails has long-term, if not permanent consequences. Drugs that fail could lead to, you know, side effects that in some cases can turn into addictions and in others. Uh, this does not have that type of consequence in any way whatsoever. Is that accurate? Uh, I would say partly accurate, meaning that every procedure we do, no matter what it is, obviously has a risk matrix associated with it. Uh, now, you know, surgery has a much higher amount of risk associated with it. Drugs also can have relatively high risks associated with them. Orthobiologic injections, less risk, but certain orthobiologic injections versus others, more risk than, than less risk. So it just depends, but obviously all of it much less risky than uh, surgery. Yeah, uh, and even getting traveling to and from the office has usually a higher degree of risk uh, than the actual procedures themselves. Again, we know that as well. Yeah, I mean, in fact, that's the conversation I had with a gentleman yesterday. Uh, we were just doing a quick facet injection for diagnostic purposes under x-ray guidance on his low back. And he'd asked about the risk of infection. And my comment was, well, there, there's a small risk of infection with this injection but you're much more likely to die this year in a car crash than you are to get an infection here today. Yeah, uh, risk is all relative. Uh, life has that element. Uh, and of course, uh, in these days, it's very confusing to know where to prioritize risk uh, and what we should or shouldn't be doing in order to, uh, to mitigate it and reduce our risk of that risk. All right, let's get back to questions. We've got uh, one submitted earlier by Victoria Holstein. Uh, Victoria asks, can degenerated discs at C4 and C5 cause CCI? Uh, not in general, no. Um, so CCI, craniocervical instability, would tend to be the high upper cervical spine, C0, C1, C2. Uh, C4, 5 is obviously below that. Uh, so I don't think it's causative. Now, there, there may be some crossover between the two, maybe what caused the CCI also caused an injury to C4-5, or perhaps what's happening at C4-5 is putting more stress on the craniocervical junction, but uh, C4-5 problems really don't cause CCI. And, uh, you know, what people want to learn as far as lessons about your body is that the spine is connected both to the bones above and below but also to everything else. And so like a bicycle chain, uh, if two of the links get stuck together, uh, that will affect the performance of the entire vehicle, of the entire bicycle, um, both in terms of the actual chain, uh, the ability for the entire chain to function the way it is supposed to. Uh, it certainly can help or likely lead towards uh, an increase of wear and tear on the chain, even somewhere else. Uh, and it'll affect the performance of the bicycle in general. Um, so these are great questions because we're looking at both cause and effect and correlation. Uh, and what you want to remember as a principle is that it is all connected. Uh, and that especially when you're dealing with the structure of the spine, literally the backbone of our body that our heads, shoulders, you know, knees and toes are all connected to, um, there is a relationship that you can't do something to one thing and not have it affect everything else in a functional way. So, uh, and the higher you function, the more performance, the more demand you put on your body, of course, the more wear and tear. A bicycle that sits there with links stuck together isn't gonna have a problem the same way that a bicycle that is out there every day moving, perhaps even competing. Uh, so those are ways to think about how your body works and 
how to invest in taking care of your body, making sure that things are moving the way they're supposed to proactively and not just waiting until it hurts so bad that you just got to cry uncle and go, I can't take it anymore. Let's finally do something. The sooner you take care of small problems, the sooner your problems go away. The longer you wait, hoping it will go away, the worse the problem gets. You can think of it as uh, a water leak that starts small, that if you don't take care of those one little droplets over time become extremely damaging. Uh, same thing with a fire, small, you can contain it, you let it go, you probably could make the argument about a virus too. If you can contain it, you're good to go. And of course, if you don't do anything, you've got big problems later. Your spine is the backbone. It contains your spinal cord. It is really the main information center, let alone the structure, that is one of, if not the most important part of your body to make sure you're taken care of. And pain, remember, means, remember, pay attention inside now, P-A-I-N. That means when you start feeling even the slightest smallest, and I'm not talking about soreness, I'm not trying to make sure you're all hypochondriacs, but I am making sure you're good listeners, that you're paying attention to how your body's functioning and when it's off and why. It's your body. If you wear it out or let it break down, much more problems later on. All right, back to Sabina. Hi, Sabina, welcome, thanks for watching. Can a Regenix diagnosed and injected SLAP tear and double hip labral tear heal if there is still a rotation in the body from CCI instability? Sacrum and lower back also treated but all my pain returns a month after PICL. Thank you. Um, yeah, so a couple of things there. Number one is with that PICL procedure, uh, we don't even expect to see changes until month uh, three or four. So everything returning after month one is pretty much par for the course, uh, meaning it takes a good three to four months for those ligaments to uh, to lay down new tissue and start to get tighter. Uh, so at the end of month one, you're kind of coming off the honeymoon period of having inflamed ligaments that are that are tighter. Um, and then you get into uh, those other problems. And uh, those other problems may be due to rotation in the body, um, in which case uh, they may not fully resolve until the uh, upper cervical instability resolves. But again, after month one, I don't even talk to patients. It's not worth it, uh, meaning that there's nothing that happens in that time frame uh, with PICL. Let's maybe uh, take that a next step further and really sort of explore the difference between, you know, healing versus let's call it curing. Uh, you know, we talk about things like ablation where, you know, you're literally burning the nerves. Uh, well, if you burn the nerve and it doesn't work, <laughs> you're not going to feel the pain and the perception is you're cured. And the benefit that most people appreciate is immediate gratification. You know, hey, done with, with the nerves don't work anymore, not feeling it. Uh, if we stopped all testing tomorrow, for example, we wouldn't have a surge in cases. <laughs> if you, you know, there's a way to manipulate how you understand things versus healing, which is really what you're talking about is, you know, you do a procedure and it takes time for new tissue to grow and for your body to heal, literally. Can you elaborate sort of on the healing process, why that is such an important part uh, of, the, of, of understanding and expectations? It, it's similar to, you know, farmers, they plant seeds in the ground. They don't go, you know, where's my corn? Uh, they go, okay, this is a process. <laughs> we know how nature works. Uh, here's the cycles we've seen. Perhaps you can elaborate in more detail about those differences because met modern medicine, especially if you watch too much television, has absolutely convinced all of us uh, that immediate gratification is a reality uh, without a cost. Your thoughts? Yeah, so it depends on the procedures we're performing. We do have procedures that would give uh, relief more short term uh, or in the short term. Let's say something like uh, an epidural for sciatica in the low back. Generally, that's going to start working anywhere from day one to two, all the way out to two weeks. And then we've got procedures like ligament or tendon healing procedures, 
where many times we don't expect results until the patient gets to month three or month four. And the research bears that out. As an example, if you look at PRP injections for tennis elbow, you know, you see this graph that takes off at month three. Prior to month three, very few patients are actually reporting relief. Now, that's the opposite of when you do steroid injections for that same tennis elbow tendon problem. There, you tend to get a sugar high, and, and the patient feels really good right away, but then they crash uh, after a couple months. So it's the opposite for tendon healing with orthobiologics uh, or ligament healing, same thing, versus the sugar crash and then the drop-off. Uh, or the sugar high and then the sugar crash that happens with steroid injections. So yeah, it all depends on what we're doing, but when it comes to tendons and ligaments, uh, they just take a bit longer to lay down tissue um, and to, to heal than uh, other things like uh, reducing the pain from irritated nerves. And that's the question. Are you looking for the sugar high? You know, hey, that feels good right now. And then you know, many times people don't think. They go, I had the inject, the steroid injection. It felt better. They get back to doing the activities that actually cause the problem um, and re-injure themselves even worse. Uh, so it's just critical to do the thinking. And really, as these questions are, are terrific, you know, really understanding and anticipating what should I expect uh, and how do I best allow my body to heal, to regenerate. I know you wrote a blog the other day about uh, rehab for animals, for example, uh, and how you know they just get right to it uh, and they listen to their body and they follow through when, again, that seems to be contrary to the mainstream approach of expensive uh, braces and all kinds of you know, other things. Uh, expectation management is probably one of the key parts, both for people receiving the procedure but also for doctors to, uh, you know, not disappoint, uh, to make sure that people do understand uh, what's possible. Uh, further comments on that, or should we go for more questions? Yeah, so I mean, that's an interesting one. If you watch a dog heal, uh, I had an Alaska male meet you one time that had an ACL injury, and the, uh, the dog surgery is pretty intense. They actually reshape the bone. Um, so this is a uh, bone, bone cutting procedure. Now, you would assume the average person would be on in a brace and crutches and then be in one of those little scooters and, you know, months and months of that stuff before you got to the point where you even started physical therapy. Watch a dog do it. I mean, you know, you obviously can't tell a dog what to do. You can't put them on a little scooter. You can't put a brace on them. Um, and he was down hard for about a week and then he was up. Um, and, you know, another week he kind of limped around and by the third week, a little less limp. By the fourth week, by the time the average person was just getting off their crutches, he was running around at, at, full, at, at a full clip. So, again, that's how we heal. We're meant to heal on the fly. There are a few exceptions where we can't heal on the fly, but those uh, exceptions are pretty few and far between. And I, I think one of the things that's really wonderful about watching animals and watching and observing nature uh, is what our instincts do. Uh, we were, we're given instincts for a reason. Uh, it is part of the whole matrix of understanding how to make the right decision, uh, how to know whether to trust ourselves, to trust our body, to trust you know, our sensibility of things uh, versus just throwing it all to the wind and going, I don't know, you tell me take these drugs, take these pills. Okay. You mean the hot looking sales rep told you that there was science behind it and, you know, we should, we should then, you know, agree. Uh, just watch the news, read the news of what's going on. There's an article going on even right now about uh, the opioid crisis and how doctor, doctors have been severely influenced by the money and, uh, you know, systematically and uh, on purpose. Uh, have been, you know, basically influenced to overprescribe in many cases, uh, if not most cases. So this is where yeah. you've got to take back the power. Go ahead, Doc. Well, that was a really interesting article. I, I, yeah. I know the article you're talking about. I mean, basically, the sales reps were instructed to look for doctors that had problems, a divorce, uh, money issues, um, and those would be the doctors they target. Most of the doctors wouldn't respond 
when they tried to push them to do this or that. But these doctors would. And so after a while, the sales reps were told to look for that doc who's troubled and going through a divorce uh, and to, you know, latch on to those physicians. And they sort of made it into a, a science or an art of, uh, of going to those folks because they would write the most opioid prescriptions in exchange for stuff. So, yes, that, that definitely happens. And we see that happening in more subtle ways as well. We see device companies targeting certain doctors because they know that those doctors will respond to the money that they can shower them on if they use that particular surgical device more often. And believe me, that goes on all day, every day, and twice on Sunday, um, all, the, all the time. All day, every day. Uh, speaker fees are one of the ways they talk about, you know, another, reimbursing. Another game that gets played, speaker's fees get, get paid. They can fly you out to a you know fancy hotel in Aspen to ask you questions about a product, uh, to do product research, um, and it all kind of flies. You know, there's a fantastic website, um, and if you type in ProPub- ProPublica, ProPublica, uh, dollars for docs, um, there's actually a whole database you can search, and you can type in your physician's name and see how much money your physician uh, takes from industry. Um, and, you know, I've gone on there a number of times just out of interest. Hey, this doc, I know that guy, I know that guy. And I've been uh, astounded sometimes the amount of money that goes back and forth. I think I was listed on there for a lunch because my PA uh, went a long time ago, about five years ago. I think that's the only money that I've got on that thing. But you know, you'd be surprised. And you, when you see a heavy hitter um, and you see that $1.3 million has left X company's hands and gone to Y doctor over the last two years, it, it blows you away. Uh, I, I would dare say it's criminal. And in fact, if you go to Wikipedia, uh, you will learn that it is criminal. And unfortunately, they pay the parking ticket. Uh, oftentimes in the millions, if not hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. Um, but because it is so profitable, it's like cost of doing business. Um, don't be a victim. Be smart. Take your power back. Keep asking the right questions. Share this information with others. Uh, and if I dare say, if I remember, uh, type the word help down below if you want to receive your copy of the Spine Owner's Manual to learn more about how your spine works, how it's made, how it functions, what the conditions and concerns that you may be experiencing might be so that you can be a more educated person slash patient if and when something comes up for you. Let's go back to questions in the time that we still have. This was submitted in advance by Carrie Simons. What tests are needed to diagnose what's causing low back pain? My x-ray showed nothing. Great question. Oh, God. I mean, uh, <laughs> it's a hard one. I mean, x-rays are, are generally not a great way to diagnose what's causing low back pain. Every once in a while, you'll, you'll see something that's pretty clear, like a fracture. Uh, but that's really what an x-ray does, or obviously degenerative disease, but then you still don't know if that's causing that. Um, obviously, a, an MRI is a good starting place, but it's only one piece of the puzzle. So an MRI finding has got to be coordinated with a good history and a good physical exam, and then you have an image. And if all of that fits together, then you get a diagnosis. But just having an MRI by itself is pretty worthless, just like having an X-ray by itself is pretty worthless. And I know that's hard for people to hear. Patients want to believe that MRIs are like the Oracle of Delphi. You go and you go into this place and they do an MRI. And it's going to magically say exactly what's wrong with you. Regrettably, that's all bullshit. Um, At the end of the day, an MRI can be helpful. It's a helpful piece of information. Um, And sometimes it can show what's wrong with the patient. But many times it needs to be combined with other information to be able to make a good solid diagnosis. Um, So any imaging study taken by itself is pretty worthless outside of a small number of situations. You know, the, the key is to understand that, as, as you said, you know, we all want to believe, I got a picture, show me the definitive answer. Uh, and the research says it just doesn't work that way. And basically all doctors know that. 
But this is very much sort of a Sherlock Holmes type of a mystery. And, you know, doctors really have to be detectives. But you also have to show up and explain and clarify with your doctor, thus this concept of a partnership, what kind of person, what kind of patient you are. Again, if you go to the mainstream approach, typically they're going to write a prescription um, to help relieve the pain immediately, but temporarily. Uh, oftentimes not explaining the side effects that come from them or the addictions that might be the byproduct of them. Um, so you really have to be a detective yourself. Some additional things you can do at home, whether you call them tests or not, but oftentimes if you look in the mirror, you may see structural misalignments. You may see your posture as an example, is one sort of window into is there something that's structurally not right with me on a regular basis? Uh, you know, if you close your eyes, march in place, look at the look in the mirror, or have somebody look at you from behind in what you would call a natural normal position, go ahead and try it. Uh, you'll find many of you, you have one ear higher than another, a shoulder higher than another, a hip higher than another, your hands as they are on your side, maybe longer or shorter. And those are all alignment issues. Those are early signs, even before you get to x-rays and MRIs, that you can do at home yourself using common sense to realize, wait, there should be a good alignment, just like the tires in your car. You know, if you're driving down the street, the alignment matters. The wear and tear on your tires will be related to your alignment or misalignment. So bones work that same way, joints work that same way. You want to make sure you can pay attention to what's going on. And the sooner you do that, the better it is. I remember going out oftentimes uh, offering people the ability for a spinal evaluation. They go, oh, my spine is so bad. You don't want to look at it. I'm, I'm too far gone. And they giggle and laugh and keep on going. But as a doctor, you know, that, that's just a ticking time bomb. That's just something that will at some point surface and become an issue that you could have probably handled much earlier. All right, we've got a few questions and not a lot of time. Sherry, let me just mention, thank you for ty typing health. Let me clarify the word is help, H-E-L-P. If you'll type that again down below, that'll get you the book that you're looking for. Thank you for typing it. Once again, if you'd like to receive a free copy that you can download right now called the Spine Owner's Manual, go ahead and type the word help, H-E-L-P, down below, and that will get you started. All right, Hillary's got another question. Uh, or I should say a comment. Uh, she says a surgeon at NYU, very trusted, respectable New York University, right? Wanted to shave my bone as part of a labral tear surgery. The reputable surgeon at Mount Sinai who ultimately did the surgery without shaving the bone told me outright he was just trying to make extra money. Doc, do you ever just sort of go is, are, is this the bizarro world? Have, have we really built our system around profit over people? Thoughts on that, Doc? Yeah, you know, you saw that blog I did on SI Joint Fusion, and that was largely because um, on the professional aspect of the LinkedIn site, we were discussing that particular CT scan, and that's a situation where someone had banged in a dowel to try to fuse the SI joint together, and instead it went in into the abdomen. Now that's a disaster, um, but the you know the conversation was around why are we doing this surgery? These are patients that respond really, really well to even simple things like prolotherapy injections and those SI joint ligaments. I mean, stuff you can do in the office blind if you need to. Um, and uh, it was an interesting conversation. You know, what, we, what I found was that there was a reasonable number of pain management doctors that had started doing these procedures because they pay really, really well. Um, and, you know, it, it was interesting eye opener for me because, you know, fusing a joint was a surgical thing, right? That's what the surgeons did. They, they, we, you know, they didn't know any better. They, it's, it's just kind of what they do. And when they have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And that was cordoned off into that area. But I never thought that we would have pain management doctors who were kind of the non-surgical good guys start doing the same procedures because they paid well. Um, and But that's what we're, we're seeing. So, yes, um, 
financial incentives regrettably drive uh, the system. And when it comes to procedural based care, the more you do, the more you get paid. So, for instance, if you have a, you know, a, a bulging disc and it's pressing on a nerve and some stenosis, if you just go in and decompress all that, it pays X. You add a fusion, it pays X plus Y. Hence, we get a lot of fusions uh, because it's a kicker. It's a financial kicker on top of what it is you're doing there. Um, and for fusion, it's literally 1.5x the work for 4x the, the payment. So if I told you that if you just increase your workload by 50%, I would pay you four times as much, I think anyone would take that deal. They'd be like, okay, I'll do 50% more work. If you pay me four times as much, I'll be rich. You know, uh, in closing, I guess let, let's just take that to the next level and really help people understand uh, really the decision that you have made in accepting the doctors who apply to be Regenex affiliates and the decision those affiliates have made. Uh, in many cases, I know that this is a money decision, that uh, there are plenty of especially younger doctors that have young families uh, that live in expensive areas that don't really have, I'll say, the luxury of being able to afford to tell the truth. Um, many of them are sort of bound to the system. They've got high student loans. They've got a high cost of living, a high cost to get into practice. They almost, you'd almost think the system sets them up to become dependent on the money. I don't know, but how, how people understand that when you accept a doctor and when a doctor chooses to become a Regenex affiliate, that what they're really saying is, I'm focused on results, I'm focused on the most conservative, most effective, most research-backed approach, even in spite of the fact that I could do less work and make a lot more money doing the traditional approach, that's what most people just walk in and ask for. Give me the drugs, do the surgery, just get it over with. Take my insurance and, you know, let's just get on with this thing and how much more effort it takes. And I'll say even courage to do it the way you do it. Yeah, listen, I mean, you know, the, when we started doing this work 15 years ago. It was pushing a very huge boulder up a hill. And in any moment, you know, a slip and pushing that boulder up that hill could have crushed us. Uh, and then it got to the point where it's gotten easier and easier through the years because more and more what we do, orthobiologics, has become uh, more accepted uh, over time. But it's still a mindset. And that mindset is trying to heal things versus those surgical techniques. So, for example, if a doctor came to me and said, I do these SI joint fusions, I'd like to throw in a little PRP. Uh, with those fusions, uh, I wouldn't accept that position on the network. Why? Uh, the mindset's wrong. Um, you know, the mindset should be, hey, um, you know, can we treat this stuff without banging something through the joint and fusing it? And maybe one in 100 people that you can't otherwise help need that fusion thing. But I'm going to treat these 99 people over here with something that's a little bit more of a rock pushing uphill, but it's the right thing to do for the patient. Same thing with craniocervical instability. You know, there's any number of docs out there these days who are seen to be aligning themselves to try to fuse the upper neck, but very few who are looking at alternative options. And, you know, that's, again, pushing a humongous boulder up that hill five years ago when we started doing that procedure. That's the key. If you know how the game works, you know how to uh, ask the right questions and navigate so that you are the winner of your own health care outcomes. That's what it's all about. You've got to ask the right questions, hopefully engage in the process of learning what's going on in your body, what's happening in the system, who should I see, where should I go, how do I determine fact versus fiction. That was today's show. Again, as we close up, if you would like to receive your own copy of the Spine Owner's Manual, type the word HELP, H-E-L-P, in the comments section down below. That'll get you 
your free download book, Fascinating Information. And if you know somebody that should be listening to this information, whether it's today or we do this program Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 12 Pacific time, please share this with them. That's how most people find out about us. We don't spend the gazillions of dollars on advertising and marketing so that we have to do these procedures and become dependent on the system. People usually find out through a trusted friend, family member, coworker, just like you. So thank you for watching. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for engaging, participating, asking, and thank you for being an advocate for yourself. It's time you take back the power, help others do the same. On behalf of Dr. Chris Centeno and everybody at the Centeno Schultz Clinic, as well as everybody on the Regenex Affiliate Network, we thank you for watching. Do the right thing. Be kind. We'll see you Friday. Thanks for watching.